Hello, I'm Tamor Nabili. Welcome to the first programme in what will be a weekly broadcast examining the situation inside Syria. Now, nine months have passed since the uprisings first began in Syria, but since then, matters have followed a somewhat different path to those in the other states involved in the Arab awakening. For one, the Assad government remains in power, and it doesn't seem to be in any danger of being overthrown, either by domestic or international forces. I say it seems because, frankly, we're not sure. The one defining feature of the Syrian situation has been confusion. The Assad government has largely throttled media coverage, and the few recent interviews the president has given have flatly contradicted all the claims made by international governments and organizations. So this program is an attempt to shed as much light as we can manage on the situation inside Syria, albeit from outside Syria. First, though, let's take a look at some of the key events that have been taking place ever since this uprising erupted in Syria. Now, it all began in Tunisia, obviously, back in January, but the wave reached Syria by around mid-March when residents of the small southern city of Dera took to the streets in protest of the torture of students who'd put up anti-government graffiti. President Bashar al-Assad at first wavered between using force against this and hinting at upcoming reform. And in April, he indeed did make a concession. He ended the state of emergency that had been in force since 1963. Nonetheless, the violence went on and the uprisings did too. The severe crackdowns began to increase in intensity. Tanks were sent into cities. Security forces fired on demonstrators and killed many of them. In May, the EU decided to impose sanctions on the government, on Assad himself and nine other members of that government. This was followed by a similar step from the US. Assad then later promised that he would make more changes and open up the country's political system and allow for changes to the constitution. But on August the 18th, President Obama finally made a definitive call on Assad to stand down. That came shortly after the King of Saudi Arabia also made a rare public condemnation of Syria and saying the crackdown was unacceptable. On November the 12th, we saw the Arab League suspending Syria's membership and on the 27th, the League adopting sweeping sanctions against Syria's government. But a few days later, on the December the 2nd, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights called for an international action to prevent civil war in Syria. And on December 11th, we saw a general strike from the opposition observed in several regions. On the 12th of December, as the UN declared that the death toll has risen above 5,000 people, the Syrian government called on voters to turn out for local elections. But the protesters didn't believe that this was any genuine move towards reform. And then a few days ago, on December the 15th, military defectors killed 27 soldiers in one of the largest attacks yet on Syria's security forces by what seems to be a growing armed insurgency. Well, in Paris, we're joined by Samir Aita, who is the editor of the Arabic edition of the Le Monde Diplomatique in London. Amar Waqaf is a member of the Syrian Social Club and also in London. Patrick Seal, a British writer on the Middle East, author of The Struggle for Syria. Gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed for being with us today. Samir Aita, let me begin with you. Uh, the question uh, that we sort of posed at the top of the show, or the, the situation that we framed, was, was one of confusion, one of a, a real inability to really digest whether we're seeing the final days of the Assad regime, or whether the situation there uh, is going to continue as it is now indefinitely. What are your thoughts? Uh, first one, first thing, one has to praise the courage of uh, the Syrian people, the Syrian young who had been uh, uh, showing their will for the change. This is a civil society uprising, asking for freedom, liberties, the ending of the Syria of Assad, the return to a new republic where all citizens are equi equal. And, uh, this regime knew that something like Egypt, uh, Tunisia would happen. He tried all things, including pushing people to violence, to angriness to sectarianism just to get them out of this and the civil society uh, this society itself came and blocked for many months any tentative of violence any tentative of sectarianism but after the sixth the seventh uh, month they got tired and part of uh, the uprising went to violence there is uh, evidence of some sectarian 
uh, uh, confrontations in some areas, and uh, the, the country arrive, arrived to a stalemate. Uh, but you, you're talking, sorry to interrupt, Assad but you're talking about civil society. Stop the uprising. You're talking about civil society in a way that tends to suggest that this is a nationwide and, uh, and um, majority movement that's happening in Syria. And, and I'm not entirely sure if, if, if that's necessarily a particularly accurate way of looking at it. Let me put that to, to uh, Amar Waqaf. Do you, do you think that this is uh, a general feeling across Syria, that this is a, the civil society wants change? Well, part of it, part of it is certainly is the case. Yes, part of the uh, the the movement that we are seeing now in in Syria has a civil society needs in it. However, the the sectarian element, the armed groups element, the 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 extremist element has been there from day one as well. Um, I think one of the problems we're having, which casts a big shadow of ambiguity on on the whole Syrian situation is that everybody was trying so far since the, you know, has been trying so far since the start of the uh, turmoil in, in March to describe the whole matter as a civil society, uh, you know, uh, uh, yearning towards freedom and democracy. That is an element indeed that is there. The government sources usually like to uh, describe that uh, part of the um, uh, turmoil as, you know, rightful demands. Uh, but there are uh, other elements as well. Yeah, and but those the, 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 the question, are, the question I'm asking serious. here is, is trying to uh, trying to shed some light on exactly how widespread this particular uh, feeling is, this particular uprising is. And uh, let me uh, let me put it to, to Patrick then, Patrick Seal in London. Well, what do you think? I mean, to what extent do you think that the protesters that we see on the streets are actually representing a majority of Syrians? Well, I think there are a few things one could say here. First of all, it's pretty clear that Syrian society is divided on this issue. I mean, there are perhaps 30% of the population which very much want to change and detest the present regime. There's another 30% who perhaps support it and are frightened of an alternative. And I think there's a balance in between, perhaps another 30 or 35% who are just uh, frightened of change. They've seen what's happened in Iraq. They've seen uh, the, the total destruction of Iraq with, with their, their civil war. And uh, they're a sort of silent majority and are just worried and on either one side or the, or the other. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about what's happening is that there's, there's a conjunction of an internal upheaval, eternal threat against the regime and an external threat. And uh, I think the regime uh, sees a conspiracy everywhere. And so it's focused its attention on the external threat and has done for many years now, but particularly now, and has rather neglected the internal scene and has tried to exercise far too much control over Syrian society, All right, well, which has really created... You, you've, you've introduced an crisis. element here of, of what's in the mind of the regime. And let's, let's, let's follow that particular thread for a minute then, because it's uh, probably a good place to start to reflect on what Bashar al-Assad thinks he's doing and what he thinks he might achieve. And uh, let me set up the conversation first of all. I'll ask all three of you what you think is going on in his head. First, I'll set, up, set it up by uh, telling you a little bit of what he has said, because he hasn't been entirely prolific in his commentary. But in an interview with Britain's Sunday Telegraph newspaper at the end of October, he did warn that this could be a situation of another Afghanistan if foreign forces invade the country uh, in the same way that they did with Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. This is what he had to say in particular. Syria is the hub now in this region. It is the fault line. And if you play with the ground, you will cause an earthquake. Do you want to see another Afghanistan or tens of Afghanistans? He also said any problem in Syria will burn the whole region if the plan is to divide Syria, that is to divide the whole region. And uh, let's go back to Paris uh, and join Samir Aita um, uh, and ask you to reflect on some of that commentary. Now, is, is this just uh, the, the words of, of a politician under pressure trying to scare people as to the consequences of what's going on? Or do you think that there, there is merit in some of that warning? Uh, 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 in fact, it's threatening everybody uh, uh, about the sectarian fighting. It's not only threatening. Uh, the analysis uh, that uh, Patrick Seed, my friend, uh, uh, put uh, is completely true, which means that you have a silent majority which is afraid of the change. And he played this game on, on, uh, from the startup to push uh, the civil uprising, uh, the peaceful uprising, uh, uh, the people going uh, to the demonstration and getting shot uh, while they had no arms. 
to push this fear to angriness and sectarianism and to threaten everybody that the, the, the peaceful Syria, the wise Syria, which doesn't go either to the Iraqi situation or to the Lebanon situation, will explode and etc. And somehow he made this, uh, 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 this vision auto-realizing, uh, uh, made possible by, by things. People getting angry after you have your friends, your sisters, your brothers, uh, 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 killed in, in the demonstrations, you get angry and it's difficult uh, after 10 months to control people. So what, what, I mean, so what you're, what you're basically saying is that his state of he mind could, is he's, he he's trying to manipulate public opinion because he wants to stay in power, simple as that. Yes, he, he could from the beginning uh, take his own uh, cousin and, and put him in prison to, to stop the whole thing. But he knew that if he does that he have to put in prison all the rest of the, the Assad family. The question is not about uh, some modifications in the, the constitution or the state of emergency or some reforms. It's about what kind of state. Is it a state for its people? Or is it the state for right, a family? We'll, 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 address that. we'll, address, we'll address that philosophical or, or question the in a moment. But I, I still want to just try and get inside the head of Bashar al-Assad to the extent that we can. Uh, and uh, Amar Waqaf, let me, let, let me ask you for your thoughts on this. To what extent is he actually genuinely believe that the country will fall apart without strong leadership? Or is he, as, is he truly a manipulative politician who's just saving his own skin? Right. I mean, uh, if we say that, that this person is manipulating the situation to his own benefit or to save his own skin, as you rightly said, we would have been only, you know, or we would be only speculating. We don't know that for fact. But what we know for fact is that a sectarian element has shown its hideous face since day one in Banyas and in Dara. Uh, it was quite small, but it fended off quite a large number of at least the minorities in Syria and indeed the, the, the sectarian majority okay, as well. Okay, well, let me stop you there for a second, Amar. Let me stop you there for a second because that, that particular accusation we'll come on to and we'll examine uh, whether there's merit in that. But again, I just want to make sure, talk about what's his state of mind because that will presumably determine his behavior in the future. Uh, and the question, let, 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 me, let me bring up one illustration that you might sort of shed some light on. Why is he not allowing the media in there? If there is genuine merit in some of these arguments he is making, then he could make those arguments to international observers and international analysts and allow people like uh, uh, us, the media, in there to, to examine those claims. And he doesn't do so. So what, what is in his head that, that uh, prescribes this course of action? I don't know what's in his head, but, uh, you know, and I don't know really why isn't he allowing or, or the government isn't allowing the, the foreign media to go in. But perhaps the government has taken a, a sort of a defensive, uh, uh, you know, step towards the immediate propaganda that some of the media, at least regional media, have, have started uh, since day one. You know, um, it is undeniable at all that some of the uh, Arab media has, has started stirring a sort of revolution rather than reporting a sort of revolution in Syria. So perhaps the government failed, well, if we allow those people in, they're going to make the situation worse, and we don't want that. But we don't know whether this is true or not. I, you know, I mean, coming here in London, for example, saying what I have to say, I think uh, uh, international media could do no harm if they go in and if we could guarantee uh, that they are, you know, safely uh, shown. Because what happened as well in the past few weeks is that some international reporters have managed to smuggle themselves in, for example, into the city of Homs, and what they have managed to do is to report one side of the story only, rather than to have a balanced report, but they couldn't perhaps cross, uh, you know, uh, okay. that block into the adjacent block uh, because of fear of being captured by, by, by someone. We'll, so, talk, we'll talk about uh, that in just a minute. Let me just agree with you on that. Let me just give Patrick a, a chance, and uh, you know, and I know inviting you to speculate on somebody else's state of mind is perhaps a little frivolous to a certain extent. But you know, you have spoken to a lot of, uh, of the Syrian leadership over the years, uh, and uh, it is slightly instructive to, to try and understand whether they believe they have the right to rule or whether they believe uh, that what they are doing is in the in the good of the people. I mean, how, how do you read this uh, psychological situation? Well, I think his mind has been shaped by the sort of crises Syria has faced over the last decade, and even longer than a decade, but certainly in his decade. You see, he came to power very shortly after 9-11. He faced George Bush's global war on terror. Then he faced the invasion of Iraq, and he knew very well that uh, 
had the Americans succeeded in Iraq, uh, Syria would have been the next target of the pro-Israeli neoconservatives. He then faced a crisis in Lebanon in 2005 with the assassination of Rafiq Hariri, and he felt that uh, George Bush and Jacques Chirac at the time, the French president, wanted to overthrow him. Then he faced uh, Israel's attack on Lebanon in 2006, its attack on Gaza in 2008 and 9. Now, from his point of view, all these were regime-threatening crises. And he tends to interpret the present internal uprising as yet another external conspiracy against him and against the stance, the nationalist stance, which he thinks he has he has pursued, which he inherited from his father, against American pressure, against Israel, uh, against the Western powers. Hence his All right. his alliance with, with Iran and with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. Which essentially echoes some of the points that Amar was making. So let, let, I mean, let's pick up this theme uh, and question whether there may be some, some merit in, in his fears. But before I do that, let me just play one more uh, soundbite from the president himself uh, and question whether... Um, his framing of the situation, even if he does believe what he says, is actually reasonable. Earlier this month, President Bashar al-Assad, uh, he did say that the nation's passing through turmoil. He said he's not in control of the brutality of the crackdown against the people, and he raised some doubts in doing so about his own control. But uh, let me just play you this small part of the interview here. Do you feel guilty? <laughs> guilty? I, I did my best to protect the people, so you cannot feel guilty when you do your best. You feel sorry for the life that has been lost, but you don't feel guilty when you don't kill people. They are not my forces. They are military forces belong to the government. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. own them. I'm president. Amar, let me uh, bring it back to you just uh, for the sake of argument. I mean, uh, even if he has good reason to think that there are foreign forces, elements, uh, uh, influences that are determining this, uh, and he is the target of, uh, of some kind of conspiracy. Is there not um, a little bit of uh, disingenuousness in that interview that he gave to the US TV stations? I mean, international organizations are talking about 5,000 people killed, and he is talking about no leader would kill his own people as if he had absolutely no clue this was going on. Well, well, first of all, I need to comment on, on the, the conduct of ABC. They took certain parts of the interview, and I would advise anyone who is interested in the Syrian situation to go and see the interview in full. It's on their website, and it was only made available to the international world like a few days after was, this short video was released. Anyway, I think he's in, uh, in a sense, control of the situation. I think what he was trying to say is that the army, the security forces, are only institutions that, yes, I command, but they are institutions with set objectives, and they, uh, you know, uh, uh, have to carry out those objectives, i.e. To, to, to protect the civil uh, uh, status uh, of the society and protect the people. Now, with regards to the number of the dead, now what we have also been uh, falling victim of in Syria is that people are reporting the number of dead as only civilians. So they say now that they are, have been, uh, th they have been like 5,000 civilians. Nobody says anything about a large proportion of those people being A, military servicemen, uh, and intelligence servicemen on the ground, and be loyal supporters to, to the regime who were also civilians and who were slaughtered by some armed groups. Uh, the issue is as well here is that because of the government isn't allowing um, the international, say, Red Cross or, or Human Rights Watch or whatever to go into the country, these uh, certain uh, uh, groups have fallen victim to people who have, you know, one thing to say. They cannot interview other people who have another thing to say, which rendered their reports really not very useful in this case. Well, uh, I don't know again why, why, why the government isn't allowing them in. Again, perhaps there's, this is a defensive measure for not allowing things to go worse. Yeah, all right. But, but, but basically, this is what we are into. Yeah. Um, maybe one day we'll get an answer to that question. Samir Aita, let me ask you to comment on what Patrick uh, Seal said a few moments ago, the timeline of events around the Middle East that might prompt any leader in that region to feel vulnerable. Um, there is an enormous history, even much more to, than what Patrick just said, uh, of evidence that suggests that people like Bashar al-Assad and countries like Syria are in the firing line of the Western powers, of the UN-led uh, organizations. Uh, and he has absolutely every reason to fear that this is not a domestic uprising, but an internationally orchestrated one. Would you not agree with that? 
Of course, and especially in the case of Syria, but also in Tunisia and in Egypt, there is always the two dimensions of any event, which means the genuine internal thing, which is that the people could no more admit to be only subjects to their leaders, whatever uh, are the leaders, and the geostrategic game that there is the U.S., the Western guys, the military bases in, in the whole region, and that the U.S. want the whole Middle East, rich of oil, to be its region, completely controlled directly or by some regional or, or other uh, forces. So, but the important thing for a leader is where he places himself. Means a, a the Syrian people is nationalistic and patriotic, not Bashar al-Assad. He made deals. He's only a leader. Uh, 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 he places himself only as a player in the, in the international uh, arena, while his major role is to be responsible to his own people. What did you do for uh, 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 the struggle against Israel, uh, or getting a peace process, or uh, doing things for your own people, both on the economic, on the social, on the political level. Uh, he speaks to, his, to, to the Syrians like if the Syrians are subject. Uh, in other situations, like in 2006 or in 2003, the things uh, that Patrick Shield talked about, people defended him, uh, 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 didn't want the regime change. While in 2006, there was a lot of powers who wanted at this time the regime change. But this time, it went too much, which means the people don't believe him anymore. All right. He's not reliable. Uh, he didn't do anything before the events to the, to the things. And, and the, the, the spring, the Arab Spring, is for every country, which means it will go to Syria, it will go to Saudi Arabia, it will all go to all other uh, regions. In the, in the Middle East, maybe uh, uh, away. This okay, is well maybe, an maybe awakening of a uh, uh, population, of the civil society. Maybe we'll do a show on that uh, as, well, as well in the coming weeks. But uh, let me just finish off this particular program by asking all three of you, and we'll continue with you, Samir. What do you think this is going to play out as? I mean, does Bashar al-Assad have the capacity to, to maintain his hold on power or not? Uh, what will happen, I hope, is that the regional power, and especially the Arab countries, will stick uh, solid on their initiative. This initiative means that to take back the uprising to its peaceful meanings, to get the people okay. into their Tahrir Abbasiya or uh, Umayyin Square, and to make the change like how the people want to do it. Right. And these people. Uh, are patriotic maybe 10 times more than Bashar al-Assad. Okay, very quickly. Amar, your thoughts on how this is going to play out? Uh, I, I think I think it, it should be obvious for a lot of people now that the government isn't going anywhere. It should be also obvious that, uh, that the street cannot go back to the pre-March 15th uh, status. So what I see next is a sort of Nash equilibrium where uh, the people and the, the government should need to come together into a middle solution. Perhaps the national opposition could play a part in this uh, because what we have now is that three divisions in the in, in of, of the people you have the diehard supporters the diehard okay. opposers and the people in between and the people in between will will not like the extremist voice so it is I think a, a fair play for the national opposition to put their hands into the hands of the government and take and lead the country out of this Patrick I think that's Seal? the best solution the last word to you the the killing has to stop I mean, there is no military solution to the problem. And, and the problem today is that the regime still thinks it can win by brute force. I don't think it can. The only alternative is a dialogue leading to a peaceful transition. Now, it may be necessary for external powers to intervene here. The Russians are trying with this latest re resolution of the UN. The Iraqis have sent a delegation. The Arab League is trying. I think people understand now that if the killing isn't stopped, the thirst for revenge will be very great, and the country will then descend into the hell of a civil war. All right, Patrick Seal in London, thank you. Thank you also, Amar Wakaf, also in London, and Samir Aita in Paris.
Thank you all for joining us today. And that wraps up this first programme in this new series, a fairly broad brush look at the events that are going on inside Syria. Next week and in the weeks to follow, we'll be focusing in a little bit more closely on those events and on the developments in the country. Until then, bye-bye.